This is the sound of the Manx steam train leaving Douglas Station in the time-honoured fashion. Opening for travel in July 1873, the Isle of Man Railway, with its much-loved Bayer Peacock locomotives and ancient wooden carriages, has continued to be a part of our island heritage almost every year since. This year, the railway celebrates its 150th anniversary, and it still continues to do exactly what it was built for, to carry holidaymakers and locals on journeys of delight through our lovely Manx landscape. Once serving the whole island, the only route left now is the one between Douglas and Port Erin. Recollections of trips by steam train to Peel and Ramsey are fading fast now. Those of journeys to Foxdale have already almost gone completely. That the railway survives at all is quite remarkable and somewhat fortuitous. The Foxdale line was the first to close, those final tickets being issued in the early 1940s. On the Peel and Ramsey routes, the locals had all but abandoned the railway during the 1930s in favour of the much more convenient bus service. Holiday traffic kept things viable into the early 1960s, but only just. In November 1965, the entire system ceased suddenly, management at the time citing essential repairs being needed. But by the following January, the worst was confirmed, and the railway was officially declared to be closed. Then in 1967, almost miraculously, the Marquis of Ailsa appeared on the scene and took out a long lease and proceeded to reopen almost the entire Manx system. Once again, the trains could be heard busily rattling along the Manx countryside, but alas, it proved to be a financial disaster, and by the end of only his second season, Ailsa was looking for a way out. The last passenger trains from Peel and Ramsey departed during September 1968. One or two works trains and the contract to take oil from Peel to Ramsey kept the lines clinging onto life into 1969. But thereafter the faint pulse stopped, and demolition by Scrapman followed in 1974. The remaining Port Erin line returned to its parent company, who ran it with assistance from the Tourist Board through its centenary years of 1973 and 74. Afterwards, the service was truncated to just a few miles between Port Erin, Castletown and Balasala for two seasons. Thankfully, though, common sense prevailed, and the trains returned to Douglas in 1977. In 1978, the Isle of Man government bought the railway, thereby securing its future. A little later in the programme, we'll take a look at how the steam railway was born all those years ago. But for the next few minutes, let's find out about the steam locomotives with two of the people who know them best. We'll climb up onto the footplate of the Caledonia and talk to the driver, Paul Rothwell, and his fireman, Dave Harvey. Firstly, Paul will explain how the engine works. If you look at the, the locomotive here, first thing you'll see is a big lever, like a giant handbrake. Now that's what we call the reversing lever. So push it forward, the locomotive will go forward. All the way back, the locomotive will go backwards. Now that lever controls a load of linkages which then emits the steam into the side of the pistons that we, we want. The lever that makes it go is the regulator. Now that regulates the amount of steam that goes into the steam chest and then into the pistons. So that's the, that lever in the middle. If we're looking forward, uh, up the top, we've got the pressure gauge and the vacuum gauge. The pressure gauge which says how much pressure there's in the boiler. The vacuum gauge is for the brakes. In the corner, we have the brake ejector assembly. Now, all our trains now are fully fitted with vacuum brakes, and that works off this assembly here. Going across a little bit further, there's two little wheels. Now, these are the injectors. They take water out of the side tanks by the use of steam and inject it into the boiler to replace the water that we've already used. And the other little wheel just below the regulator is the blower valve. Now, when we open the fire doors, we don't want the fire to come back out into the cab. So we operate the blower valve, which creates a false draft, which actually pulls the fire into the firebox. We are governed to a speed of 25 mile an hour. Um, but this locomotive being what it is, it's a goods locomotive, it goes a little bit slower than the Bayers. So how do you judge that then? Because I can't see a speedometer anywhere. It's time and mic. Um, if you're due into a station at 13 minutes past, you time it so you arrive nice and easy. Um, you can also, the, the drivers will also have their marks that they reach at a certain time. 
that they're not they're not going too fast. It used to be in the day when we had the short lengths of rail. You used to hear the clickety clack, clickety clack, and then you could have a an idea of how fast you were going. But with the continuous welded rail that's coming in now, of course, that's not possible. Usually about halfway through a journey, um, you'd see the driver checking round the engine. What are, you, what are you looking for in those checks? I'm looking for anything that's running, maybe running hot um, on the bearings on the wheels. Sometimes they, they run a bit warm. On the rod ends, sometimes they run a bit warm. So you check it with the back of your hand to make sure it's, it's not getting too hot. If it is at the time, you, you will do something about it. Also, you're checking round to make sure that nothing has dropped off. The locomotive is 138 years old, so <laughs> as we all know, as we're, we're getting old ourselves, bits drop off here and there, so just making sure everything's at where it should be. What's the, what's the best part of this job? Uh, you might say the best part is seeing the people with the smiles on their faces and coming back and uh, coming up to the loco, giving their memories of when they used to travel on the school trains, when they used to go on the Sunday school picnics to Glen Willen and whatnot. But I'm, uh, I'm a bit more self-indulgent than that. I love coming in and getting on this loco, driving it or firing it. It's, to me, that is that is the ultimate. You never see myself or Dave without a smile on our faces. Paul Rothwell, driver of the Locomotive Caledonia, when I caught up with them at Port Erin Station a few days ago. On the footplate with Paul was fireman Dave Harvey. I asked Dave about the fireman's job and what time he started in the mornings. Well, if uh, the engine's been uh, in steam the previous day, or it's still warm, for instance, then uh, it's normally about three hours, so we turn up at uh, seven o'clock in the morning. So you spend about three hours cleaning it as well as lighting it up and getting it ready. Now, back in the day, it was the fireman's lot to clean the underneath of the engine, the wheels and the rods and whatever. Is right. that still the case? Uh, yes, yes, it's still down below. Um, the, the driver does the top, um, the, <laughs> the fireman does underneath, and he also does the cab as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a bit evolving. <laughs> A fireman's job, it may seem to be fairly self-explanatory, but there's a lot more to it than just shoveling coal, isn't there? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, that's what everybody thinks, oh, he just shovels coal and that's about it, but um, if you're not engaged in your duties, it's also the fireman's job to be looking out uh, for the driver, it's his second pair of eyes, really. Um, and also looking for the flags, looking for signals, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to think about, really. <laughs> it's a very demanding job, in fact. <laughs> My father got me interested in them ever since I was a youngster and I worked on the Seven Valley Railway across before I moved out of here myself. Um, but when I initially moved over and I found out you actually got paid for doing it over here and instead of being a volunteer as we were on Seven Valley, I, I just jumped at the chance because that's, you know, it's the ultimate really. <laughs> so, so were the railways part of the decision to move over to the island? Sort of, yeah. Um, I, th I suppose the wife sort of made the de decision for me really because as a normal job I work for Network Rail as a, a signal engineer and um, I'd just been promoted the year before, so, <laughs> so I was leaving quite quickly. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I haven't regretted it, not a day. On the course of a, of a journey then, you're going back from Port Erin into, into Douglas now, but how much coal and water does a return trip use at one of these locos? Uh, that, that could be quite dependent, Mike. Um, obviously, depends upon the load you're pulling, how many coaches, um, how, how well your driver wants to go <laughs> is another one. But uh, in general, the this one, for instance, Caledonia, holds about 520 gallons of water and uh, it's about a ton and a half, almost, of uh, coal. Um, with Welsh steam coal that we're using at the moment, I won't even use half of that, to be honest. Um, it's quite efficient. So, so the full bunker does so, you a full return trip? It can do. Um, we do have to top it up the, uh, every time we go uh, to Douglas. But um, for, for one round trip, yes, there and back. So where's, where's the hardest work done then when you, when you set off on your journey? Uh, two places, to be honest. Uh, the first bit, it, you're instantly at it out of Douglas. It's uh, 1 in 62 for two miles up to Kerrystal. So um, it doesn't give you much of a breathing time from a, a sort of cold engine in the morning to you hitting a hill straight away. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the big ones. And also on the return journey from Balasella round to um, Santon Burn, really. So how many carriages could one of these locos take by itself? Um, officially, it's seven out of Douglas. Um, if you're banked, you can take eight. But um, we've been discussing before, we, we probably think something like number 11 in the condition it's in now. We'd love to have a, probably do 10 out of Douglas if you really tried. So if, you, if you've got over a certain number of carriages behind you, you have a, occasionally have another loco assisting. Yes. How do the crews communicate with each other then while the train is in motion? Is it instinct or line knowledge or are the signals used? It's a bit of everything there. Um, obviously, the drivers know what other drivers going to be doing, really. So he knows where he's going to shut off and 
various things. You also look at what the other driver's doing as well. But um, initially, when you're starting away, the first the lead engine will blow a whistle, so you have to acknowledge that with the engine that if you're banking, for instance. And um, and yeah, it's, it, it is to do with line knowledge as well. You know, you're always looking what the, the lead engine's doing. And give away a little bit of a secret. Can you tell if the the other engine or the other crew aren't pulling their weight? Uh, yes, if you if you <laughs> if you're leading and they've shut off, <laughs> then, um, yeah, you're sort of dragging them then. So uh, yeah. To tell the story of how the Isle of Man steam railway came into being, let's travel back in time. The Isle of Man in the first years of the 19th century was described as being a backward and primitive place. It was considerably behind England in its development, lacking in roads and trade. Most of the men worked in the herring industry and tended to the land only when the fishing did not call them. There was mining, but many of the mines were ill-managed and often flooded. There was little or no industry apart from brewing. Fifty years before the railways were introduced to the island, there were just three established carriage roads. They were Douglas to Castletown, Douglas to Peel, and Castletown to Ramsey. Before the coming of the railway, the population of the island was relatively small. But the governor of the day, Henry Locke, was instrumental in devising a plan to improve things. By 1860, visitors had begun to take advantage of the new Victorian institution, the Middle Class Vacation and holidaymakers started to appear on the island during the summer months. The promotion of a steamship company took place in December 1829. This was later to become the Isle of Man Steam Packet Company. The Steam Packet, of course, still trades today, the oldest continuously operating shipping company anywhere in the world. If a railway could be built, its principal aim would be to carry summer visitors, as local traffic alone could not justify the cost of construction and operation. Most of these visitors would be based in Douglas, and the railway would have to entice them into exploring the then somewhat backward remainder of the island. In winter, sailings to and from the island were three times weekly, but in the height of summer they could be up to five times daily. In the period June to November 1872, upwards of 130,000 tourists had landed at Douglas. The importance of the provincial ports was a governing factor in planning a railway. Douglas was preeminent, but Castletown and less so Peel also played their part. Ramsey Harbour was mainly concerned with the coal trade, whilst others imported provisions like tea, sugar, tobacco and general goods. Castletown was the centre of agricultural imports. There were 600 sailing vessels engaged in fishing, 3 to 400 based in Peel and the remainder in Ports of Mary. Peel was a useful anchorage. In certain weathers it was preferred to Douglas and a breakwater was built to improve it whilst the same was done at Port St Mary. By the time the railway construction had started, a new breakwater at Port Erin was in the final stages of construction. This breakwater, and the trade it was hoped it might bring, would convince the railway planners to extend their ambitions and continue from Castletown to the island's southernmost port. Port Erin breakwater would see the very first steam engine arrive on the island to aid its construction, a 7-foot gauge 040 locomotive named after the Governor Locke. Sadly, though, the new breakwater was not up to the job, and despite vast expenditure by the government, it literally blew down after being severely damaged by a series of huge gales, culminating in total destruction in 1884. The proposed new passenger railway would link Douglas with Peel, Castletown, Port Mary and Port Erin, with further plans to extend to Ramsey in the north at a later time. So what exactly were these proposals? In 1824, a canal linking Douglas and Peel was suggested, but by 1838, the idea of a railway of the same intent was being discussed in some earnestness. There were several attempts to form a railway before success was achieved. In the end, though, the Isle of Man Railway Company Limited was formed at a meeting at the St George's Hall in Douglas at the end of 1870. The company directors were made up of local politicians and businessmen, with a remarkable man appointed as general secretary. He was George Henry Wood. G.H. Wood remained with the railway from that first day until his death in 1925, some 55 years later. From 1871, routes were planned and shares issued, with work almost ready to begin by March 1872. At this point, a new company chairman was appointed, the UK-based railway entrepreneur, the Duke of Sutherland. The Duke embraced the railway age enthusiastically. He was an early advocate of the narrow gauge and joined the board of directors of the Isle of Man Railway Company upon its formation. 
along with like-minded fellow director Sir John Pender. Charles Blacker Vignol was appointed as railway engineer. The directors entered into a contract with Messrs Watson Smith of London for the building of the Isle of Man Railway. The contractors were engaged to complete and open the line from Douglas to Peel for traffic on or before the 1st of June 1873, and then to Castletown and Port Erin on or before the 1st of June 1874. The works were to commence immediately, and a contingent of engineers arrived to stake out the course of the line. By May 1872, the share issue was fully subscribed. With fresh cash injected into the scheme, lands were bought by compulsory purchase and the soil was broken at various sites along the Peel Line. Scores of railway labourers or navvies arrived on the island to supplement the local workforce. From the local press, in June 1872, the railway. A schooner arrived here on a Saturday night with material for the new railway. The work has been rapidly pushed forward from Braddon Church and on towards Peel. By August 1872, the local press were able to report the railway construction workmen to the number of about 120 were actively prosecuting the cuttings and embankments at various points along the line between Braddon Church and Union Mills. But it wasn't all plain sailing. From the press of August 1872, a strike was reported with the bridge builders downing tools for a short time whilst the grievance was sorted. A number of navvies commenced operations at Balacrane and St John's and also near the Peel Terminus, so that the Peel Railway is now in the full course of formation from one end to the other. Work continues apace upon the new railway in September. On December the 21st, 1872, the Duke of Sutherland and Sir John Pender arrived back on the island for a board meeting, at which Mr Mackenzie is appointed as General Superintendent. The following day, the party were at Port Erin to view the new landing pier, and after doing so, took lunch at the Falcon's Nest Hotel. The first of the company's steam locomotives, named Sutherland after the Duke, arrived as a kit of parts on March 29, 1873. Built by the Manchester firm of Bayer Peacock and Company at their Gorton Works factory, two further engines followed in quick succession, bearing the names Derby, as a nod to the Earls of Derby, the former Lords of Man, and Pender, after Sir John Pender. Bayer Peacock and Company would go on to supply a further 12 steam locomotives to the island, all a development of the 240 side tank design. During April, carriages and wagons began to arrive on the island, and in the press there was speculation that the first through train from Douglas to Peel might run ahead of schedule on May Day. Rumours of a further visit by the Duke and Sir John Pender circulate, and rails and sleepers are suddenly removed from the Port Erin line construction and sent over to the Peel line in order to complete its length. The new steam engines, having been assembled, can be seen busily running from site to site delivering supplies. On May 3rd, 1873, the company is in Timble Court and in the press, applying for licences for refreshment rooms at its stations in Douglas and Peel, much to the anger of the anti-drink brigade. The application drags through the Manx legal system for two months, almost right up until opening day. On the same day, the very first cross-island train journey takes place, conveying the Duke of Sutherland, directors, contractors and officials. The train starts at Douglas at a quarter past two, with the engine, number one, driven by Mr W. D. Wilson. By the middle of May, more carriages had arrived, but the refreshment room debacle was still slowly making its way through the courts, following numerous objections. On June the 3rd, the Manx Press reported a fatal accident on the Peel Line when an 11-year-old boy is run over by a locomotive and two wagons. An opening date of July the 1st, 1873 was set and an invitation sent to the Prince of Wales to attend. But by June the 7th, word had come back that unfortunately the Prince would not be able to be there. On the 28th of June, final arrangements for the grand opening were revealed with the company directors, politicians and dignitaries to attend. Following the opening, a grand ball was to be held in the marquee situated on land alongside the new station at Douglas. On the 1st of July 1873, after multiple proposals and several false starts, the sun rose to herald the dawn of a new railway age on the Isle of Man. Locomotive No. 1 Sutherland took the opening train with the official party travelling aboard the Duke of Sutherland's private saloon coach. Next to the ducal carriage, an open wagon conveyed the band of the Bengal Fusiliers, who were to play music at every stop. A bank holiday was made, so the whole island had chance to witness the events. On returning to England after the opening, the Duke of Sutherland, in typical business-like manner, inquired to G.H. Good by telegram, How much did we take today? This telegram survives to this day in the care of Manx National Heritage. Since that 1873 opening day, the Isle of Man Steam Railway has operated almost continuously, 
the only complete break being in 1966. Keeping the fleet of Victorian and Edwardian steam engines and vintage carriages in service into the 21st century can present some challenges, as their once cutting-edge technology is now 150 years old. I spoke to Railway's chief engineer, Andy Cowie, and asked him what sort of problems could be encountered. That's absolutely right, Mike. Yes, it's uh, quite a unique position to be the team trying to be maintain such a, a, a fleet with, with such history behind it. Uh, principal difficulties are it's very difficult to find parts uh, and even some of the uh, instruction manuals have had to be rewritten and be lost in the mists of time. Um, uh, and clearly it is very vintage transport as well, so there's a very limited range of supplies for that, that sort of equipment. Luckily, th- there's a keen uh, and small but keen uh, t- team of heritage supporting firms that are, that are around and about helping us out with the various bits we can't do ourselves. So how much of the maintenance is still done in-house by your local workforce? Uh, pretty much all of it, actually. All the r- routine maintenance, day-to-day inspections, uh, safety checks and tests are all done by our own team, who are very skilled, dedicated staff. Uh, have been, been working on the railways for qu- quite a range of time. They've got the good experience, they know what they're doing, and, and they do a great job of it. So what sort of jobs are now go off-island to be done? It's probably the biggest specialist jobs is, is all we try and keep everything on island as much as we can. Uh, it, it, you know, it's good for the island. It's our heritage that we're looking after, and it, it's only right that we should do that work locally. Uh, but bigger stuff such as remanufacturing boilers and the like, it, it's that there isn't really the facilities or the, or the need to have local industry doing that, and uh, maybe wheels and axle sets. So it's the, the bigger engineering jobs, specialist engineering rail jobs, are the, are the only ones that we would send off island. Now, we've no shortage of water on the island, but coal must be a different matter, and and suitable coal at that. How much coal is burned in a year, approximately, to keep the trains running? Well, last year, we went through about 440 tonnes of coal uh, from what was quite a a long extended season as well. Um, We have had some difficulty in sourcing coal uh, down the traditional avenues uh, due to various things, but we are safely sourcing coal now. Uh, We've got a reliable supply route. Longer term, we are looking at possible uh, ways of reducing our reliance on coal um, but that's uh, something for the future. How does coal consumption then compare to per passenger mile to a, a, a car? It's, it's quite surprising actually Mike. I'm glad, glad you asked that. It's, uh, it's considerably less than the consumption per passenger mile of an average passenger car, d- diesel or petrol. Uh, we're running about 125 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometre equivalent. Um, which is the the standard way of measuring that, versus about 150 to 170 for a passenger car, which is uh, surprising, really, but uh, does does say a lot for the efficiency of the original steam locos. How many of the original 16 locomotives remain usable today? We've got four of the original 16 in service. Um, They're working very well. Uh, Most of those have been rebuilt, obviously, several times over their lives, Um, and they're, they're providing reliable and safe service. So back in the day, there would have been uh, almost 90 passenger carriages. How many of those are still in use? Yeah, there's uh, 21 in use. Uh, We've got 18 out in service and three under rework and maintenance at the moment. Is this enough or could you do with a few more? Always could do with some more. (laughs) It's it's sufficient to to meet the level of service we're providing at the moment, but uh, a few extra would allow us a little bit uh, more flexibility on our maintenance schedule. We're trying to squeeze all our maintenance in over... uh, the non-running periods, which are getting shorter and shorter. So how important would you think it is that local people support the railways? It's absolutely vital. Uh, the key piece of our history and our heritage, uh, and the part of something that makes the Isle of Man unique. Uh, I think most people are very proud of our railways. Andy Cowie, today's chief engineer, proud to be carrying on the work started 150 years ago by Charles Vignol on the opening of the Douglas to Peel Railway in July 1873. Although the original line is now gone, and also the routes to Ramsey and Foxdale, the Isle of Man Steam Railway lives on, with the line between Port Erin and Douglas still operating. The beautifully kept locomotives, with shining brass and polished copper, provide a look back to a bygone age when steam was king, and how lucky we are to still have such an attraction. In next week's programme, I'll be taking a journey along the old Douglas to Peel line, visiting the station sites and talking to some of the people who can remember working and travelling on the trains.